Next up is Justin Cormack on RUMP. And uh, Justin is a NetBSD developer who does a lot uh, of work in RUMP. From time to time, he uses that scripting language too. And so the next 45 minutes are yours, please, Justin. Hi. Right. Um, oh, it's right, that's working. Um, Right, uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about um, running applications on the NetBSD RUMP kernel. I'm also going to talk about the stuff we've been working on with RUMP kernel and an introduction to it for people who aren't familiar with what it's for and some stuff that we're planning to do with the RUMP kernel as well. Um, so um, the slides are possibly on that URL. Um, eurobsdcon.miriabit.eu, although the, uh, they didn't seem to be available from this room. Um, but there are links to stuff on them. Um, I, I don't know why, if someone can fix the, uh, why they're not working from here. Um, uh, the DNS seemed to be working, so it's a bit weird. Anyway, but so there's links if you want to go there, or if you're um, on the live stream, it might be helpful because the slides definitely seem to be working if you're not in this room. Um, so, um, the RUM kernel is a kind of um, a slightly odd thing. It's, it's something that's only available in NetBSD, and it's you know one of the unique features of NetBSD. Um, and it's basically it's NetBSD, but with a whole lot of stuff taken out. Um, you, it's it's most of the kernel, but it can't execute binaries. It can't schedule threads. Um, it doesn't understand anything about users or anything like that. Or, well, it kind of does, but it doesn't understand memory management or anything like that. So it's a kind of, um, it's, a, it's quite a lot of the NetBSD kernel, but with a whole lot of stuff that's not there, which sounds kind of useless. Um, but really, it's the drivers. Um, and the drivers are kind of, they're the majority of the kernel. They're the um, quite often the most frustrating bit of the kernel, and they're the um, bit that takes a long time to write. They're, they deal with actual hardware, which is buggy. Um, and they also deal with the, the kind of nice bits of stuff that, as a user, you like to use with a kernel. So it deals with actual file systems rather than just raw blocks on disks, and um, sockets, and TCP, and stuff like that are all in the drivers. And so that's the stuff that, that users really need in a kernel. Um, I mean, users like to be able to allocate some memory and things as well, but that's, we'll come to that in a second. Um, so what we, what we do with the RUM kernel is basically we use something else to do those missing parts, um, some sort of host system which will do memory allocation, um, and just let you run these drivers on their own um, either on top of another operating system or in a special purpose application. We'll go into that in a second. So the easiest way to just think about it is just a way of running drivers, unmodified drivers, from NetBSD somewhere else that you, want, you might want to run them. Um, and you know, why might you want to do something weird like running drivers not in an operating system? I mean, you know, they sit there in your operating system, they work. Um, you fill in the, you kind of fill it, basically you want to fill in the gaps and use um, a very simple um, kind of virtual machine-like capability to, to um, run these drivers on top of some other kind of environment. Um, and so there's basically a hypercall there, which is very much like a virtual machine. It basically provides memory allocation, threads, mutexes, random numbers, and a clock pretty much, and some I, a bit of I.O. Um, and the original use case of this was running this in user space on NetBSD in particular. Um, with The main point of it was actually for testing, and testing was kind of the way I got interested in the RUMP kernel as well, because I like testing, and tests, testing's good. Um, and it was, I, I started going to the um, talks at FOSDEM about NetBSD, and I got interested in, in testing on NetBSD, and that's what kind of brought me into this, in being interested in this thing in the first place. Um, and in particular, you can test 
little parts of your kernel in isolation. So you can just test a single kernel driver without having to create a system, boot into it. Maybe the rest of the kernel doesn't, isn't working because you've broken something else. Um, because you don't have to boot into it, it's much quicker. Um, you, can, you can build a full RUMP kernel from scratch in 10, 15 minutes, like, and less than that incrementally, run the tests. Um, so it's a, um, you've, you've really got this kind of uh, environment where you can say you're working on a, on a new driver, you can change it around, rebuild it, test it quickly, run some tests against it, so on, make sure it's still working, and do kind of test-driven development for drivers, which has always been difficult. A lot of people have worked around it in their development processes for drivers by um, uh, writing a prototype driver in user space or hooking it up to user space to poke, to poke the hardware and see what happens and so on. And, um, or, um, but that's difficult to do with things like, you know, if you want to change the TCP IP stack, you've really got to boot into the system, run some tests and so on. And that's, and okay, with virtual machines, that's easier um, but, than it used to be with actual hardware. But it's still actually much easier just to sit in user space, run it, run GDB on it, put, set breakpoints, see what's going wrong, um, you know, get a core dump when it crashes, and just treat it just like a normal program you're writing. And it's, um, it's a sort of sane and sensible way of working with stuff. Um, and the other original use case, apart from um, tests and development, was running stuff in user space, like file systems in user space, um, the type, fuse type things, but if you want, and um, the old mTools type tools that we always used to use for, um, with, for file systems in user space, where if your kernel doesn't have support for that, you can run a file system in user space. But again, those were often kind of clunky and used use duplicated code. The important thing with run kernel is the code you're running is exactly the same code. Um, so it's not modified at all. It just sits there, it runs. You just compile it and, in a, and link it slightly differently into, a, into user space. Um, until very recently, the apps... 99% of the use case for RUMP was the test suite in NetBSD, which has used RUMP for, for many years now. Um, it basically sp is specifically written for RUMP, so it says RUMP in it, it says RUMP says make the, and so on, or there's, um, there's been a hijack library that used preload to try and work around that. Um, and it's Usable, it's using the tests, it's, pretty, it's been useful for a long time, but it's kind of slightly clunky and painful because you have to specifically write for a rump kernel, which is a kind of weird thing to do. Um, so I started working on rump kernel about, um, seriously, about a year, um, year and a half ago. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of the stuff um, that's happened really since since that period, some of which I've done, some of which um, Andy, who's the other main developer, has done, some of which other people have done. We're starting to grow a decent community around RUMP kernel now, and, um, I'll, talk, and uh, I'll talk about some of the other things that people are doing. So the first thing I got involved in um, was someone suggested on uh, the Lua mailing list, that, or the Lua JIT mailing list, actually, which is a JIT compilation of Lua, that it might be nice to run uh, Lua directly on Zen, like the, um, the Erlang on Zen project, and um, there's various other ones of these X on Zen projects, um, Mirage and things like that. And I thought that sounded quite an interesting idea. Um, and I've been uh, getting more and more interested in the RUM kernel stuff, and I thought, well, one way of doing this would be to use the RUMP kernel to um, provide the system layers that um, Lua needs to run. I mean, Lua is a very straightforward POSIX portable program, but it obviously needs some stuff to actually run. It needs to open files. Um, it needs some memory allocation. You need basic, um, basic system calls. Not a lot, but it needs something. Um, so... Um, 
it actually turned out to be um, relatively not too um, horrible to do the basic thing, because Zen in its tree includes a really stupidly simple operating system called Minios, um, which is just their, well, originally I think it was just their, as a part of their tests and as generally as part of the um, uh, example of how you actually use the Zen hypercall there. Um, so it turned out that Minios actually had um, pretty much everything you needed to, well, pretty much almost everything you needed to actually um, build a hypercall there for um, the rump kernel built into it already because the things that the hypercall there for rump kernel is actually, again, just the stuff you expect, clocks, random numbers, and some memory allocation, and so on. So um, actually getting the rump kernel to run was relatively straightforward, but um, the thing that was actually uh, we wanted to do was actually run an application on it, which um, an unmodified copy of Lua. Um, so um, the process we went through for, to do this was basically well, we need to, obviously we we need libc to compile Lua. So um, we took NetBSD's libc and basically um, ripped out the actual system call there that actually just calls the system calls and just replaced those with calls to the equivalent rump kernel functions um, and compiled the rest of libc with the Zen cross compiler um, and then compiled a library version of Lua, which is relatively straightforward to do, linked it all together and um, actually got um, got it to boot and got it to run the um, rump kernel test suite and everything works fine um, so that was really the first um, time we actually run a real full application on on the rump kernel it was actually it was quite exciting and um, I, um, it boots up in almost zero time because um, it doesn't um, especially if you don't mount a file system or um, anything like that. It's really quick. You can just, you know, um, run it with the Zen XL tool, bang, runs your code. Um, and so this was, um, you know, so this was my first involvement in run kernel. It, it was all quite, quite productive, relatively painless. Um, the, um, the patches against libc that we had to do to do this were um, a bit messy. Uh, but not too bad. I'll talk about um, those a little bit more later. Um, so the next, so I, I was quite um, quite excited by that, and I started playing around with the rump kernel a bit. Um, the next thing I, I worked on in particular was portability. Um, at the time I started, it ran the rump kernel. Obviously, runs on NetBSD. It was always run on NetBSD. Um, it also ran on Linux. Um, and um, it that was oh, and it ran on Dragonfly at that time, I think, and Solaris. Um, um, so I went around and fixed the the FreeBSD and OpenBSD ports, which was mostly straight, fairly straightforward. Um, and um, and Android, which is a weird environment, which um, but I thought it was quite fun because you can boot up a rump kernel on your phone and show, <laughs> show people. Um, I, have, I did realize I haven't got it installed on this phone because I've got a new phone, but um, that that's quite nice. And also architectures, um, cross builds from, particularly from non-NetBSD platforms on uh, on these different things that were a bit of a pain, but it runs on um, all, all the, the, I run, we run, it's, Extensively tested on on you know ARM x86 MIPS PowerPC Spark and it'll probably run on everything else. There there are, there are very few issues now. The, the um, um, you just need to if you if you're not using it on NetBSD and you're using a different set of compilers and so on. The, um, I, I think we've ironed out most of those kind of basic portability issues now. There's still work to do, but it's it's much better. Um, 
it, um, you know, so if, you've, if you're porting it to another weird environment, a lot of the work's been done. Um, that also meant I also got involved in setting up tests. Um, so basically, um, we do continuous integration with the rump kernel code. There's um, every commit on Travis CI, which um, runs on, it's an automated service that runs from GitHub on, or anywhere else on Linux. And then there's a build bot set up, um, which runs on pretty much every other uh, one of the supported platform, or a large selection of the supported platforms. Um, uh, originally just on the rump kernel commits, but actually, of course, the, the rump kernel is NetBSD, and all the code's really in NetBSD. So um, I set up a builder to build from um, NetBSD current, which um, runs every um, currently every hour and a half. Um, you can see it looks like this. The links are on. Uh, if you click through, the links are there. So this basic. These are all the different platforms it builds on. Um, and it actually it does take less than an hour to run on all those on on um, currently on two servers um, with about eight virtual machines, some physical machines, some cross builds. Um, um, as I said, each each build tends to only would only take maybe ten minutes on a single machine, but as they all run in parallel, it, it slows down a little bit. Um, I, 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 Buildbot's kind of annoying, uh, but it does, it's easy to set up. Um, it is annoying to do things that I'd, I'd like to do on continuous integration, like, um, and I've played around with it a bit, and it's kind of possible to hack it, but it's painful. I want to pull a single source, because at the moment all these do their own checkouts. Pull a single source, build that, um, save the builds so you can use them elsewhere, um, run the, the cross-compiled code on, on real hardware or emulated hardware um, so you can see if it actually runs because only the non-cross builds run, run the actual tests mostly. They, so a lot of it's just a build test, not a runtime test. Which um, but it does ca it catches a lot of the portability regressions in NetBSD, so I pick those up really fast. Um, I th as far as I'm aware, I'm the only person doing you know, regular cross builds of NetBSD. So if you break something in our tool chain, um, I'll probably notice you know within a few hours that something's broken. There's an, I haven't got automated alerts, so it doesn't hassle me, but I do tend to notice fix those things because. Um, that's kind of useful. And it also uses LJ syscall, which is a, some code I wrote before to run the case. Well, this, this is a program I wrote in Lua, which, or LuaJet again, which um, basically understands the ABIs of um, NetBSD, Linux, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, different releases of, and runs syscall, system calls directly against those kernels. It runs about 130 odd tests, depending which which BSD you're running, because some of them are specific to a particular one. And it takes about a minute, so it's very much the fastest way of running a smoke test on a new build. Um, it doesn't require any compiling because it's all interpreted, so it really is, you know, very very quick to run tests. So. Um, um, so all so all those that aren't cross builds will run that, um, and and so that gives some extra confidence that someone hasn't broken something. Um, again, I w that's testing at the moment. I'm gonna I'll talk about a bit later about test the more testing that I want to do. But um, it's certainly um, you know we look we we look at this and. Um, the rump kernel builds the the rump kernel script that you use for build rump for which is for building stuff not on net if you're not using netbsd or if you want to use it um, you know as a snapshot on netbsd um, we we take a, a build that we know works take a snapshot and that's available so we're happy reasonably happy that the stuff that's um, available for users is 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 
working and tested and so on. Obviously, there are there are potentially bugs, but um, that are, you know reasonably happy that the tests are there. So, running applications is the thing that was quite exciting with with the Zen port and. Um, Last Christmas, over Christmas last year, I started thinking about whether you could actually run applications on the rump kernel as, in a straightforward way, you know, applications that aren't written as rump in it and so on, specifically for rump, but normal NetBSD applications. I was wondering if you could run them in the user space um, port of rump kernel, which is Absolutely, is what people mostly use because it's the easiest thing to use for testing. It's what you use for driver development and so on. And I thought, if we could run applications, then um, imp not necessarily things like Lua, but the actual basic things that, were, that would be really useful because it had been bugging me for a while was that you couldn't even run a basic um, thing to configure your rump kernel because normally, you know, say you want to... Uh, test the RAID drivers, you need to build a RAID set and um, you know there's a there's a bunch of commands to command line commands to build that um, but you can't actually run those commands so what you had to do was basically at the moment if you wanted to write say either a test for the RAID system or or if you want to just experiment you know modify it you basically had to write something that custom for the rump kernel that did the the IO kernel or whatever um, commands the, the subsystem you were working on needed. And that was, you know, kind of annoying if you want to do anything complicated. So I thought maybe there's some weird way in which we can get this stuff to compile in user space. Originally, the first thing I came up with involved um, compiling the um, NetBSD code as a shared library and loading it into a, a wrapper program that um, <coughs> called, called main in the, um, in the shared library and it worked, it was a bit horrible but it kind of worked, it showed that this was actually possible. Um, then I, a, bit of, a month or, so, or two later I um, decided it was too annoying and um, I managed to write another version, basically a script there, which um, it's kind of um, basically the, the main issue is that you've got, um, you're trying to run a NetBSD libc in order to compile your NetBSD um, commands, but you're also running a libc on the host, and of course they have exactly the same symbols in them. Um, and so, um, it, but one set's supposed to be talking to the rump kernel, one set's actually supporting, so talking to your real kernel. And um, obviously this is a big mess. Um, if you just try and link your programs together, it's just not going to work. So I came up with a, a scheme that does work, which basically um, does a whole bunch of symbol renaming. Um, and um, I'll tell you exactly in a minute. Um, but it works, and you can basically compile. Um, there's a little script that compiles stuff out of the NetBSD tree, um, so you can compile pretty much all the the core user space stuff. And um, the way it works basically is you um, you take your the stuff you're building for NetBSD, you link it all without host libc at all, and then use object copy to rename a bunch of symbols so that they point at the rump symbols, fix up a few horrible things like main, because you're going to have another main when you're going to link in, um, uh, localize all the symbol names in the object that you've created so that they, and then um, link it in with rump and the host libc. Um, if you click on that, link there, you can see the script. I do have a plan to, re to do a third rewrite to make it even nicer and more straightforward, but at the, um, it's, um, at the moment there's a cross-compiler now, which will cross-compile to this and run the link scripts as if it's a GCC wrapper, um, which works fine, works on NetBSD and uh, it works on Linux. It 
you can hack it to work on FreeBSD, but FreeBSD's GCC is doing something a bit weird. Um, and so it's a bit hacky, um, but it it's, needs fixing. But uh, um, it, but basically, it's it's usable, and it's um, and here's an example of how you use it. There's there's um, there's kind of two modes for using the Rump kernel in the user space. This is example with the the Rump server, and now the Rump server is a thing that basically runs the Rump kernel in one process, and you send it system calls from another process, which seems a slightly odd thing to want to do. Um, but otherwise, you tend to run the rump kernel, and then when you terminate the, your process, the rump kernel terminates, which means effectively, in sort of machine terms, you boot up your machine, it runs something, and then it stops, which isn't that much use if you want to just modify the state of something. So the, the remote process like this, you can just run the the newly compiled IF config and you get um, you know you can see your network interface you can just create new network interfaces um, you can ping stuff um, it pretty much everything works There's a set of test scripts that runs through and creates RAID devices and and so on in the in the repository this is the current list of supported commands that have reasonably been tested um, and um, m most of them are useful. Um, some things in a rump kernel context aren't particularly useful, and, um, but basically create fi <laughs> creating file systems, um, creating network interfaces, um, syscurtle, um, mounting file systems, making directories, um, copying stuff into the, in and out of the rump kernel, um, bit of permissions and stuff like that, um, making device nodes, um, which obviously you need to do when you want to talk to devices, um, uh, stuff for wireless, um, so wireless devices, you can deal with that, um, uh, encrypted devices, uh, encrypted files and stuff like that. So it's, it's a decent set. It's really easy to add more stuff. Um, um, it's just a bit uh, you just need to test it. It could do with more tests as well to make sure that... But most things work. There's a few weirdnesses because of things the rump kernel doesn't support. Um, in particular, rump kernel doesn't really support signals. So occasionally things use signals. Um, the NetBSD implementation of ping 6, but not ping, uh, uses a timer with a signal. Um, so you can only ping once. <laughs> um, and then it just sits there waiting. Um, um, but generally, you can just use this stuff as if you're using a normal computer. I mean, that's the thing. You can just sit there. There's a little shell wrapper that sets the paths and shows you which rump kernel you're talking to, and you can just sit there and do IF config and stuff like that. And, um, and it can just sit there and run, um, and you can just script it all to set up your your rump kernel, how you want for testing your driver you're writing and so on. So um, basically, um, it's, you've suddenly got this whole user space. You can suddenly start actually configuring drivers, testing them. Um, there's this cross compiler that can probably run most user space code. There's some thread support, which is a bit experimental, but has been it does work as well, so that's kind of so if you've got code that uses threads, you can even run that. Um, hasn't been tested hugely heavily. There's a few things that use fork that and so on, which may or may not be supported. There is actually the um, the run remote does have an emulation for fork, so things do kind of work. Um, and in fact, mostly do work in user space, but they obviously won't run in a run kernel somewhere else. But for so for the user space tools that call fork and exec and so on, actually, there's enough emulation to make those work. So you can pretty much, um, uh, there's basically a, bunch, a little emulation layer that emulates the things that you can emulate in user space. Um, so a lot of you, a, a lot of anonymous M map and things like that all, all work. It's, it's, it's a decent way to, to run stuff. Um, it does need cleaning up and, upstreaming, 
the, the patches to libc are now very small because I upstream most of the... It's, there are only patches to the make files. Um, there's no actual patches to libc at all. It's non modified libc. It just doesn't build in the syscall stubs and it... Um, that's really the main change. Uh, but it needs a bit of... Um, and it's all... Uh, there's a flag around... If defs around everything, it's... it's uh, all the small things got fixed uh, over time, I think, and there's um, so just it, I'll probably uh, work on upstreaming it when I get back. Um, it also needs fixing for non x86 architectures. Just again, just adding the extra defines around the things in the make file. Um, it's only just dealing with that that system call there, and I think if we if we, it's very non-intrusive. It's again, as I said, it's just in the make file. Um, I'd like to build some more of user space in the libraries. I mean, it, we might as well just build everything, really. Um, um, but at the moment, I mean, things like it would be nice to build the ZFS tools so that it's easy for someone to start. When someone decides they want to start doing some more work on NetBSD ZFS, like, um, I don't know, uh, um, then having those tools, the ZFS tools built, would be useful. Um, so you can, because file systems are a perfect thing for running a user space, you, you just need to put, a file to use as a block device, and you can you can get going or multiple files if you need multiple block devices. It's actually really straightforward. There's no need to ever ever boot a file system while you're developing it at all. Um, uh, so you can should be able to just do those uh, development in user space. And um, I even had I had a chat with one of the um, Linux uh, ZFS on Linux developers who said he might. Work on NFS uh, on ZFS for NetBSD if he if he could do it all in Linux. So <laughs> they didn't have to actually use NetBSD. So you know we, it's there's uses for these things. Um, um, I'd like to run NetBSD tests uh, using this, which would be really nice because it basically means you could run user space tests without actually booting the kernel at all, um, which would be nice. Um, so as you're developing stuff. Um, Rather than doing a full kernel build install, Anita, it's not. I mean, Anita is nice and easy, and it's quite quick. But just being able to do make and execute so your your test script just there without actually even you know as you're as you're developing makes it easier to do um, test driven development and so on. Um, and the build process for the user space stuff is a bit slow and longer than it should be. But it's one of these things. I mean, one of the things I've spent most time in doing since I've been working on Rump Kernel is looking at build processes and watching them scroll past um, <laughs> and wondering why they're broken and trying to fix them. And um, in a way, Rump Kernel is mostly about building. It doesn't actually, the, there's not actually a lot of code in it. There's a, little, but there's a lot more build than make files than there is code. Um, and um, I'd like to do continuous integration testing of the rump run code on current at the moment. It's um, because there's these libc make file patches, um, which are annoying. To, when those are upstream, to be able to run it on current, which would be nice. Um, more things we've been working on. Um, I wrote a green threads implementation of the. Um, um, user space, the run kernel um, hypercall there, which seems a funny thing to want to do. I mean, it, it runs on pthreads normally, which is as you'd ex kind of as you'd expect. Um, this basically just uses um, get context, swap context, to, um, so it compiles on most things and runs the whole NetBSD kernel basically as a uniprocessor kernel in a single um, single process with no threads. Um, one of the main aims of this was actually for running on embedded stuff where you want to compile rump kernel, but you um, don't actually have a whole pthreads library to run it on, so it won't compile. So you've got something really basic. But there's also got other um, uses. It would be really easy and quite fun to make an entirely deterministic implementation. Um, rump kernel it's kind of straightforward, and particularly with this implementation, it's very straightforward. All the threads run to completion. 
um, or when they block, and then it switches to another thread. So the only stuff that makes it non-deterministic is the input that comes in through the rump hypercall layer, which is the random numbers and the clock, and anything you've got on a file system or something like that. But um, doing things like exact replay of um, your a NetBSD test case, for example, should be possible just by feeding in the same timestamps and random numbers. Um, um, and so you should be able to do things like reproduce um, bugs exactly, even if they're non-deterministic and so on, or modify things and modify timings until you get you hit a non-deterministic bug and then be able to give it to someone and say, look, run this, this, this driver's got this lock-up in this situation things like that. So I, th um, I think that would be quite a fun thing to do. It should be really easy now because all the scheduling stuff is all deterministic. It's just the input state that's, um, that's not. And that's, and, but as that all comes through, with this small run piper call there, it's, it's entirely easy to replay the same values when on the same, on the same hyper calls. Um, uh, so that's a project for anyone who would like a nice project. Um, Next thing that Anti added was PCI support. Um, the original, the firstly in um, Linux user space, because uh, Linux ha conveniently has um, Bing Linux two users ways of writing user space PCI drivers. Um, they're both differently annoying. It's very typical of Linux. Um, um, the one we've done so far is UIO, which is Quite simple, works for a lot of devices, uh, but it doesn't work with um, some other devices. Um, doesn't like MSI interrupts, I think, and it, it, it'll just say no for some devices. Um, but it runs, but it will, for example, run uh, most wireless cards, for example, and um, certainly Anti did some wireless device development using the rump kernel entirely in user space on Linux uh, to write a NetBSD driver. Um, and you can sit there, you can start, you can basically um, reinitialize the device if, if your driver goes wrong as you're developing it. You can, um, you know, you don't have to, you can, you know, it just sits there. It's, it's not, it's not being used by the host. You disable it from the host kernel so the host kernel doesn't talk to it and you've got full control over it. You can run your driver in user space. Um, and so this is, this is really useful if you want to work on um, developing a new PCI driver and, um, and you want to make it much more difficult to lock up your machine and so on while you're doing it. Um, and you don't, if, and you, again, you, want, you can use GDB on it and things like that. Um, the second Linux one, VFIO, um, I'll probably write a driver for that. Um, you need an IOMMU to use that, and um, most of the machines I've got don't have IOMMUs. So, um, but I think I've uh, I've got one that does now. So um, I'll try and fix that. Um, it would be really nice to be able to run it under a BSD. Um, my current thought that I've not spent much I need a quick look at is that FreeBSD is probably the next easiest target with because um, Beehive basically has user space PCI driver framework now and I reckon it should be possible to adapt that because that lets you put devices into your hypervisor uh, I mean, into your virtual machines and that's pretty much all you need. You basically you want to remove them from the host kernel and be able to talk to them from user space. It's pretty much the same thing. So I reckon a, a FreeBSD port would be quite easy, and then that would probably be applicable to NetBSD much more straightforwardly. Um, but um, um, but that's it, it's definitely a, a real, real improvement for device driver development, not having to actually... Um, Develop your device driver, you know, on a while actually having to boot the kernel into it, especially um, um, 
and without having to do things like pass through to a virtual machine and so on, which you can do, but it's you know it's much easier just iterate in user space. Um, there's also Ante decided that he, uh, as well as booting on Zen, he wanted to be able to boot on various other hypervisors in particular. Um, so there's a he did a project a few months ago, basically to um, boot on a basically a either bare metal or a, a virtualized x86 machine. Um, this is, it's a very, um, it's a really small, it took him a week to write it, so it's, it's a, um, but in a way that's the thing about the run kernel, you've got all the drivers, so in, in a week with 100 lines of code, you've got a kernel, you can boot it up and it's got PCI support, it's got um, VertIO support, so if you're on a KVM you can get the emulated network device and disk, um, and it'll run on actual hardware with a BIOS, you know, with a BIOS. It's uh, x86 32-bit only at the minute, and it's, um, it uses the green threads type code, so it um, doesn't have hardware threads or any single processor, but it, um, it's a um, Proof of concept, really. The, the, my plan with this is to do an ARM port to um, the embed microcontroller platform to see if I can fit NetBSD rump kernel onto a microcontroller that's too small to actually run NetBSD proper. And um, uh, so I need to, you know, see how small I can squeeze it in to, to try and boot it on a microcontroller because that would be a, again, a fun thing that where this kind of bare metal thing, which doesn't have a full operating system, it just has the absolute minimum you need to run, kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, and that's the nice thing about you know NetBSD; it's very portable to this kind of thing. So you can run it on maybe on an even smaller toaster than previously. Um, uh, so I'm, yeah, I've got a little um, microcontroller with a Ethernet um, that I'm hoping to play around with and get that running on. Um, the main thing is working out how little memory and storage you can get away with. So I bought one with a slight excess of memory and storage so I can start big and cut it down to, to a more standard size of my controller, see how much space it actually takes up, um, see how much you can optimize the build and depending on what you want to run on it. But that's my one of my Experiments. Another thing um, that happened completely outside the NetBSD community is the um, GNode decided that they needed some file system drivers. Now, GNode is, um, uh, I think, uh, the correct thing to call it is a operating system framework rather than an operating system. They support um, um, the L4 microkernel, and they have basically. Um, changed it to run the NetBSD um, file system drivers on their kernel in as microkernel type user space processes with 3,000 lines of untrusted code that runs that. So that's quite exciting. We also got a Lego, which is quite exciting. Um, so fundamentally, there are four different environments that we now support. Um, the rump kernel running on, so user space hosted, the sort of original standard one, the Zen power virtualized type environment, the bare metal one, or microkernels as servers, and um, that's basically, and this is the sort of architecture of it, which you probably can't see very well from there, look, look at it. We have much better documentation, still needs improving, but um, there's a wiki, there's a lot of stuff, um, and there's a lot still to do um, in improving documentation, upstreaming, and so on. People are really interested in high-performance network stacks in user space. Um, so come and get involved. This is um, where we are. I'm running an operating system conference in London on 25th of November, which you should come to. And there's a hack day, rum kernel hack day the day after, it, also in London, following on from that. We'll also be at FOSDEM, I think, me and Antti. Um, there's a mailing list, free node, rump kernel, there's usually someone around. Come and, come and ask questions and uh, get some help.
questions? All right. Um, hi, Justin. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I remember and I know you're not anti, but it's, I remember anti writing at some point. I have a keen disinterest in hardware, and he was explicitly not going to the root of rump controlling hardware. Do you know why that was and why that changed? Um, I think someone, um, as far as I can work out, someone paid him to write a, a wireless driver. He hated it, and he still hates the hardware, but um, he will he will write drivers if you ask him. And uh, so he decided he would write it all using rump in user space. Um, wireless um, was a really good test of all the user space infrastructure because you have to configure your wireless card, set up, you know, point at access points and all that. So there was a, it was actually a really useful thing. And it's a good test of, you know, PCI and so on. So it was a, it was, a, although he doesn't like what, he was complaining about the size of the spec for the for wireless and so on. It was um, it was a useful thing to do, I think. All right. Hope to see you in November. <laughs> <laughs> How much work is uh, adding support for new uh, I/O MMU architecture, for example, on ARM? Um. On ARM? Yes. Uh, um, I think starting with V7. Oh, uh, uh, yes, there isn't there. Yes. Um, I don't know. I think um, I haven't really looked at that on ARM. Um, I shouldn't have thought it was too much work. Um, it's not, um, you know, mainly. I would have thought you could probably do it in a week, as a guess. Finger in the air, but I don't. It, it's not. It's not horrible. You mentioned uh, Minix three in one of the slides. Yes. Back. You know, we've been at least you know, thinking about maybe pointing RUM to Minix three. We have a generic POSIX interface, although no kernel threads. Any idea how much time it would take to port it to generic POSIX system? Um. To. Uh, if you want to run it just as a user space process, yeah. um, um, it it's very little work. I mean, it, it should it, it should run already in user space. I imagine though you want to link it into the um, the Minix three um, kernel rather than user space no. or something. So, or, no. uh, okay, no. okay. In theory, it should just it should, it should just run. run. I, I in the, theory. Um, I had a quick look, but I think um, um, it should be a matter of cross just cross building it. And I tried building it natively, and um, but build.sh isn't very happy building natively on Minix three at the moment. Or at least I ran into something. Mm, when did you try that? Um, I don't know, a few weeks ago, very briefly. But I should I should talk to you about. But I think it should uh, probably a cross build might be easier. But it should it should just work. I mean, I, it, um, as long as you support. I mean, it, it runs on Android, and Android is the most uh, useless posi POSIX <laughs> user space there is. So, and I, 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 the Android port took me a day. Yeah, but Joe, Joe one said, in theory, theory and practice are the same. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but the Android. The Android port really w took a day, and it was, um, um, and that was just dealing with the things it had missing or with broken headers or things like that. You mentioned signals were an issue in Rump Run, so was the thought to rewrite some of the code that uses signals to different ways of doing timers or add signal emulation into the library? There's a source of signal emulation. Um, there's a source of signal emulation, but it's uh, it's not. I don't like it. Um, uh, it's it's a bit. Crap. Um, I'd rather rewrite the code and not use signals because I mean the weird thing on NetBSD, ping four doesn't use signals. Ping six does. I mean it's just like um, they, the code could be more similar between ping four and ping six. Frankly, it's it's um, 
there's no reason to use... In my, I, I'm not a big fan of signals. Um, there's no reason to use signals to do something like timers. You, uh, you know, we've got, we've got a nice thing. We've got KQ. We've got, uh, you know, it's... it's um, you know, it's, there's no real reason to use signals. Well, a lot of legacy code has it from the 40 years ago. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, but it might... Yeah, I, I think, yeah, the, there's no real reason. I mean, signals do work in user space, Rump, but not necessarily on other platforms, so I don't really... They, um, and they don't necessarily quite work exactly right. But there's a, there's, there's a, you've got a choice of ways to emulate that. It's not, it's not really worth spending more time on trying to emulate them, I don't think. Um, I mean, it's because Rump doesn't understand processes, so signals are host signals, really, and so they can't really interrupt a Rump system call, but you can kind of fake it a bit. It's, 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 but it's not, very, it's not really worth it. Um, ping 6 was the only thing that I came across where signals seemed to be an issue. Um, and for tests, you only need to ping once, normally, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Well, do come and talk to me and um, harangue me about things if you want to ask more questions. <laughs>